Jim, why don't you step on up here? Um, Jim's a special friend of ours. Um, Short bus. <laughs> he's, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Uh, he, he's part of the Fresh Cats, the Freshwater Kayak Anglers Tournament Series. And uh, he's the organizer that makes all that happen, provides insurance for our inland freshwater events um, through his uh, program. And uh, he was nice enough to step up to uh, put on this presentation. For those that don't know, the Striper Clinic at the Port of Sac is the third event in a series of three. We did the Folsom Flame, uh, Lake Amador, we did Trolling for Trout, and then this is the third one. So um, he's going to talk about that a little bit more. And then also, you know, you guys are all here to learn about striper fishing from your kayak. So uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to you again. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Thanks, man. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, this is, uh, like Dan said, this is getting ready for the POS Stripers event. Um, POS is Port of Sacramento, in case you have other ideas. But, uh, you know, after a lot of time on the water, you might be saying POS Stripers. So, um, if, if, how many people regularly fish from their kayak already? All right, everybody's already fishing from their kayaks? Sweet. Okay, so, in general, if you're fishing from the kayak, and you hook a bigger fish, it just takes a little more time, you know, make sure that you don't let any slack in the line, and that's about the only difference between kayak fishing and boat fishing. You get but a free for, ride too, right? A, a free ride if the fish is big enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but um, in the port and generally around here, striker fishing is about bait, and it's about lots of bait, and some trolling, but that takes a lot more patience. Um, so, I know in California there's been all this huge debate about strikers in the last uh, what, 40 years, but it's really been coming to a head in the last year. Uh, some people want us to catch them all and pull them all out, and some people want to let us you know, catch a few and get really big ones. And all that's because strikers aren't native to California. They're native to the East Coast. They range from Nova Scotia to Florida, basically. Um, and they eat everything they see. They love to eat. They just eat and eat and eat. Um, they were introduced to California in 1879 by the then head of California Fisheries, who saw the San Francisco Bay and said, this would be a great commercial fishery for striped bass. And so he put them in. And it was a great commercial fishery for striped bass until the 1940s, when the bay collapsed and went. And then the striper fishery fell out, and they cut the commercial fishery off and restricted it to recreational anglers only. But Given that, we do have a good recreational fishery, and although we don't get the six foot long, 125 pound East Coast stripers, like Newfoundland and whatnot, the really big ones, we do get 80, 90 pounders, you know, which is a five foot long fish. It's like as big as my wife. Um, so that's, that's pretty awesome, you know, a fish as big as my wife. I'm thinking that's cool. Um, but in the Delta, they're, you could say they're anadromous, like steelhead and salmon, but not quite, because a lot of times they'll migrate out into the delta and just stay in the delta. They won't fully go into the salt water um, in a lot of years. And then in other years, they go out into the salt water and they range up and down the coast, and people catch them in the surf, and they catch big ones in the surf and little ones in the surf, and then they come back in. But they always spawn in the rivers, um, usually sometime in August, September. Uh, and then they move up into our into our cooler cooler rivers like the Sacramento, the McCallum, the American. Um, eventually, probably even you know might get some down on the San Joaquin. Um, but that's what they're doing. They're they're spawning in the fresh water, and then they're going out into the delta to grow larger. Of course, there are a lot of fish that come in to spawn, and then see all this prey and just hang around. We have these pods of really big stripers on the American River that are 35, 40 pounders, and you'll see these groups of like five or six of them. And you know the guys that float the American often know exactly where these groups hang out. It's like the same fish all the time, every day, big stripers. So some of them hang out all the time in their in their spawning streams. Um, of course, when it comes to fishing the port, which we're going to do on this weekend. There's a few big ones that hang out in the port all the time, but they're really, really smart. <laughs> There's a lot of small ones that hang out in the port, and they're not so smart. We catch those. Um, 
So if you want to catch stripers in general in the, in the Delta system, you know, not talking about Southern California stripers or out in the ocean, um, smaller stripers eat a lot of grass shrimp and uh, they eat a lot of smelt too. So your smaller minnows are going to work really well and people generally troll those from their kayaks uh, fairly slowly. You don't have to go really fast. In fact, if you go really fast, your little smelt spins and spins and spins and then he dies then the fish aren't interested and you've got you know 300 feet of twisted line. Mm -hmm. So a nice slow troll with your little smelt or you can just anchor up with some with a weight and cast out a weight with you know a foot of line and a clump of grass shrimp wound onto a hook with some magic thread and uh, you know pick up quite a number of juvenile striper that way. A juvenile striper is by the way up to like 20 inches so a juvie is still legal to keep. Um, and these main food sources come from, uh, there was a, a USGS paper published three years ago where they did like 40 years of stomach content analysis on striped bass. And I just picked the top six food items. Adult fish eat a lot of grass shrimp. They eat a lot of thread fringe shad. Again, a non-native fish introduced to California to be foraged for striped bass. Uh, they eat a lot of American shad introduced to California because um, the Fish and Game Commissioner at the time, in the late 1800s, thought that they'd be a great sport fishery. So they ate American shad, they ate these threadfin shad, they ate a lot of mud suckers, which are a native fish. Um, some people call them sculpin, some people call them fatheads. Um, grow about this big, they look like little slimy eels. Uh, and then they eat everything else they see. So the adult stripers just are eating machines. But if you want to catch adult stripers, you got to keep in mind that they eat fish, 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 and fish. Uh, in the Sacramento area, the best places to catch them really are the Sacramento River, the American River, um, the Upper Delta, the Port of Sacramento. Uh, the Columbia River always kicks out a bunch of good sized fish. The Tuolumne River has a bunch of good sized fish. Um, you know, Sherman's Island, Rio Vista, a lot of great fish around here. And you can realistically expect once a season to get at least a 20 pound if you're fishing often. If you only fish a couple times a year for stripers, 24 inch, 25 inch fish, that's about a six pounder. You know, you might get a, three or four of those fish every year. And that's pretty good. Um, you know, California is full of all these seasonal fisheries. So everybody targets, you know, one species this month and one species the next month. And stripers are really good in the fall through early summer. So October through June, you're going to catch a lot more stripers than you are in August, you know, and, and July. But that's because they've moved up into the, into the upper delta to spawn in September and October. As soon as the water temperature hits like 54 degrees, they move up to spawn. And at 56, they're most likely to be fully active. So they like it pretty cool. That's why they head out to the, to the bay. Uh, the other thing is, all of these rivers are tidal influence. So if you think about just how far up the tide reaches, the last gauge the uppermost gauge on the Sacramento River that, ha that sees a tidal influence every day is the I Street Bridge. Now that sees two feet of tidal influence every day in Sacramento, 94 miles from the Pacific Ocean. My house on the American River is only like six river miles from tidal influence like every day. So if you want to catch stripers, you want to watch the tides. And you want to hit the, like, not the beginning of the incoming, because it's usually pretty slow, but you definitely want to fish all of the incoming and you want to fish the full high, because that's when the water is at its highest, and so the bait fish are out and foraging around, and the stripers follow them up. A lot of times, uh, the bait fish live in these, these um, weed mats and everything, and the weed mat tends to grow right about in the middle of the tidal influence. So when it's high, the bait fish move up and the stripers just come right over top. When it's low, the bait fish hang out real tight in it. And the stripers are kind of, you know, they hang out on the bottom and don't waste their energy. Um, 
for fishing for striped bass, especially from a kayak, you don't have to go as heavy as you would if you were on a boat or fishing from shore. You know, a lot of times 12 pound line will do you. If you're like me and Adam and Nowaki that really hate to lose fish and tend to horse them in, you'll use 25 pound main line or 30 pound main line. Um, I prefer a braid and then I put a, I call it a top shot, but it's just a leader you put on the end four or five feet and use 20, 20 pound or 25 pound fluorocarbon is what I prefer. And um, always use the fish finder. Always, always, always. When <laughs> Sherry's like, no, I don't have a fish finder. <laughs> but, um, I'll just follow you guys around. Well, well, <laughs> when, you're, when you're looking for stripers, they're really mobile. And so you're not actually gonna see the fish all the time. You know, you'll mark fish as you paddle around and as you drift. But what you're looking for is structure changes on the bottom. So if you're paddling around, you know, like at the Port of Sacramento and it's 16 feet, and all of a sudden it drops on your fish finder to 30 feet, that ramp where it's dropping down is where you wanna focus your attention. Because no matter what the tide is doing, the fish are gonna hang out there and wait for any water movement to, to tumble bait down or push bait up. And that can be, you know, dead critters and live fish and crawdads and everything else. But that, that structure is what you want to find. Um, there's a spot out in the middle of the Port of Sacramento, in the middle of the Turning Basin, where it goes from 30 feet up to like 13. And the guys that know find that spot, mark it on their GPS, and fish it first every single time. <laughs> because if the fish are actively feeding, they're going to be focused on that hump. They're going to be watching that. Otherwise, uh, the fish finder comes in handy when the striper are schooled up, like when it's really cold. If the water temperature is down to 40 degrees, 45 degrees, they're going to be schooled up because they're going to be feeling really lethargic, and they're more effective as a group in finding bait fish and finding other fish. So you will see that if you paddle over them. Um, but with the fish finder, one thing to remember is that you have a cone that you're viewing, right? Because the fish finder sends out the sonar. It, uh, the one I use has two cones, 30 degrees and 60 degrees. But even a 60 degree cone in 30 feet of water, you're only seeing a swath at the very bottom of, the, of whatever water body you're on of you know, 45, 50 feet wide which isn't very much if you're fishing, you know, six miles of river, you know, and then if you end up in the shallows and you're only in 10 feet of water, you're only seeing eight foot. And then, you know, so you gotta, you gotta keep that in mind that your fish finder isn't so much as a fish finder as a structure finder. Mm -hmm. You wanna look for those drops, you wanna look for that change. Um, if you're fishing for stripers, you want a net. They have really, really sharp dorsal spines. So if you, you're going to lip them, you're going to get them in your boat, they start flopping around, they will hurt you. They will, those spines will get in your hands, they'll get in your pants, you know, they'll stab your legs. It's just not fun. Uh, I like a fairly big bag, 18 inches, you know, that's decent size. Just because you never know when you're going to find a 30-inch fish. And you don't want to be fighting a 30-inch striper and get them up to the boat and you've got a 14-inch net and you're like, no, this is not going to work. Because then you throw the net down and you're worried about it going away and the striper's going apeshit, you know, right there with you. And you're trying to get your, get your thumb in its mouth or whatever you're trying to do to get it by the gill. Um, yeah, if, if you've been trolling with a, with a plug that's got two treble hooks on it. Uh, yeah, a net, definitely. And that, that's followed up with pliers. Take pliers with you. I know this sounds really silly, but take them because you'll want them. If you get a good hook in, in a striper and their mouths are really tough, you don't want to be trying to do, deal with that, you know, with your bare hands if they're flopping around in your lap. Uh, a lip grip tool is really, really nice. <coughs> Mine's at home. I was supposed to bring it. Yeah. I have one. If you, I can pass it around later. If you want. Yeah, but any, any lip grip tool because it, it latches down on their, on their mouth and then you can just handle them. You can control them without getting spined. And a camera. Everybody should bring a camera when they go fishing on their kayak. Because nobody believes you. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, just, that's just a simple truth. Oh, I got a 38 striper off my kayak. And everybody's like, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So uh, to catch stripers, we have <laughs> we have four options here: bait, 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 and lures. Um, there's a reason we say bait because stripers are predators and they want to eat live things. And you can troll around all day with lures, and that's really effective. I passed around boxes of lures. I love trolling with lures. But if you really want to catch stripers and you don't have a lot of time, like at the tournament, it's only six hours long, you really want bait. <coughs> Live, cut, dead, that's what you want. Live bait one, bluegill. <laughs> Everybody that fishes hardcore for stripers uses bluegill. They're big, they're fairly easy to catch, they're dumb, and they're tough. They're really tough. <laughs> now, you have to catch them where you're fishing. Because state law doesn't permit you to like you know go to go to the ponds next door to your house and catch a dozen bluegill and put them in a bucket and take them with you to go fishing. Um, if it was a native fish, they might. If it was a native non-game fish, they might. So a lot of times those are illegal for bait anyway. <laughs> yeah, native non-game fish. Those would all be endangered probably. <laughs> yeah. Because there's really nothing native left in California, so so just catch your bluegill where you're at. <laughs> uh, you can use a bobber with a, a bobber rig is so easy for bluegill. Just a little tiny bobber, a little hook, a little hook, and a wax worm, or a tiny jig, or a little itty bitty crackbait. You know, there's a million ways to catch bluegill. You can use, you know, red worms, wax worms. Um, you know, any any number of little stinky things that wiggle, the bluegill will take it. Um, you want a bluegill that's not really big. See, there's that's my hand. So that's like a four-inch bluegill. It's probably about the perfect size. Um, a really big one might catch you a really big striper. And if you get a really big bluegill while you're bait fishing, and you don't want to eat it because they're pretty tasty, um, use it for cut bait. Throw it in your tank and use it for cut bait later. But the small ones, even the little ones, are really great for stripers. So that's that's the number one thing. Um, and we'll we'll hook it up just like we do the minnows, but we'll talk about that in a second here. Uh, if you if you're not confident that you're going to be able to catch your bait there when you get there, buy minnows, buy big minnows. They're like two dollars a piece or something. It's ridiculous. It's really horrible. But if you want to catch stripers, buy big minnows. You can buy mud suckers too. Those are three dollars a piece usually. But mud suckers last forever. If you get well, usually. <laughs> Some of the bait shops will give you these mud suckers that are kind of sad, and then you get to the river or the lake, and you've got a bucket full of bait and four dead mud suckers. You bought six. You're like, what, the, what happened? Um, sometimes they just look dead and they come back to life, but a lot of times they're dead dead. Uh, if you hook them up with the mud suckers, we always lift hook them. They should last on your line without repeated casting for an hour or two. That's a long time for a little fish that's been hooked up that you're dragging around. But they're tough. They're really tough. Um, jumbo minnows, they usually last about a half hour. Sometimes an hour if you're just sitting still, like you have a jumbo under a bobber. They'll last a good hour. Um, with the mud suckers, you don't put them on, under a bobber, you put them on a, a sinker rig. So, um, you know, just like a, a half ounce weight ahead of them. And uh, you want it to be close to the bottom. If you're trolling, you want it, you know, a foot or two off the bottom when you're trolling a mud sucker. <clears throat> so a half ounce or a one ounce and, you know, put your rod in your rod holder and paddle along at a mile an hour or maybe less just enough to keep him out of the weeds because they'll wiggle down in the weeds and you'll think you got a great big fish, but you don't. Um, for, for jumbo minnows and for bluegill, um, all three of these options work really well for hooking them. I'm not a fan of the back hook on the minnows because even the jumbos, a lot of times you hit the spine and then they die real quick. And if you go above the spine, there's not necessarily a lot there. So they can get really wiggling and just like come off. Uh, with the bluegill, the back hook is really good because they just take off. They don't care at all. I mean, they're like little tanks. Uh, again, with the bluegill, the tail hook works really, really well, especially if you're in deeper water. 
say you're you know you're over a point in you know surrounded by 40 feet of water and you're over a 20 foot point if you tail hook a bluegill he's going to go straight down to that point he's not going to fuss around on the surface so he's going to immediately be where the fish are hanging out and that's what you want especially if you're just you know like slow drifting if you drift with the wind or if you're on, you, know, you have your gps going and you're just like maintaining position and moving ever so slowly that that tail hook uh, bluegill is really really fantastic uh, I don't usually lip hook my bluegill because when the striper takes them, it's really, really aggressive and they'll swallow it really quick. So unless I'm using uh, like a circle hook in, in the box I passed around, there's some big circle hooks. Uh, a lot of times you get a gut hook. But, you know, if you have a five inch bluegill and you have a gut hook striper, then your striper is probably 23, 24 inches. <laughs> as long as you're not, you know, close to your limit, you're good to go, right? As far as as you know, how to how to how to deal with it. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys looked at Steve's report last week, but he's a big fan of the slow drift, and I I agree with him on that completely. A lot of times, especially at the port, I'll let a <coughs> let a live minnow out uh, lip hooked, and I'll I'll let it out like 40 feet paddling, and then stop and just hang out and I just watch that line and just watch it watch it and eventually you'll see that line will really start to move it's not doing this little thing here or you know slowly curving around or whatever all of a sudden it's like <laughs> and that's a fish <laughs> right now with, with stripers a lot of times they'll take that bait right away and <laughs> but if you set the hook real quick you can just like pull it out of their mouths so when you're when you're drifting for them, sometimes you want to let them have a little line. If you're using a spinning reel, open the bale, let them take 10 feet of line, you know, a couple little wraps off the reel, blah, 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 and then close it and set the hook. You know, you want to make sure that they've committed to that fish, that they've at least got it in their mouth all the way, because they're, you know, they're not quite like a bill fish that beats it with its bill and then comes back and scoops up the leftovers, but they do attack very viciously at first and then eat. So, uh, you know, you want to let them have the line, have the have the minnow for a minute. And, it, and the same with bluegill, you know, you don't, if you're floating a bluegill and all of a sudden it's, it's playing around and going down, as soon as it goes down, that first block, you don't want to just set the hook right away. Because the striper's nailed it and probably let go and he's coming back around for another hit. You want to wait until it's down, 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 until he's really taken it like he means it. Uh, otherwise, you're going to end up with, you know, torn bluegill and bloody bluegill and next thing you know you have cut bait, not the live bait that you spend all that time getting. Um, yeah, the anchor and cast, I really like that because some days I'm really, really lazy. You get out on the water, it's a cold day, the water temperature is like 50 degrees, the fish are just moving real slow on the bottom, any, any amount of trolling that I do is not going to entice them, so I'll just, you know, back up to a, a spot on the bank, drop my anchor, or ramp the back of the kayak up onto the mud, and cast out where I think they should be, and just wait. Um, but with, with live bait, that can be a problem, because if you're using, say, a, a sliding sinker rig like I've got on one of these rods, uh, that bait will swim away and find a spot to hide. And if he's hiding, you're not catching any fish, right? So. For the, for the anchor and cast method, we're going to go to um, cut bait for that. Uh, cut bait is really effective. A lot of times if you're out in the delta and you stop at a, at a bait store, they don't have live shad. They have buckets and buckets and buckets of big thread fin shad that are all dead. They caught them that morning, they brought them in in buckets, and all the guys are buying them. <coughs> They're like three and a half inch long shad. Um, some of the guides will put them on a, on a shad rotator, so they troll it, and it just rotates along. They use a you know, trolling swivel with it. Uh, but other guys will chop that shad up or give it a bunch of big cuts, not all the way through, and then hook that, hook that piece. And so that stink, that blood and, and you know, panic slime is drifting around. And then you can do a, do a weighted cast, you know, where you drop it down and let it sit on the bottom. You can use it for, uh, you know, cut shad, cut bluegill, like that really big bluegill you caught and didn't feel like eating. 
Um, sardines, a lot of people use uh, sardines and anchovies because it smells bad. And the stripers, you know, they're right in on it. They, they will follow their nose to your bait. Um, yeah, you, big chunks, not little chunks. Like if you think about it, about going and buying a pack of chovies, they're six inch chovies, right? So if you're gonna make cut bait, don't make cut bait. Make cut bait, you know, big cut bait. If you have a big bluegill, cut them in half. Just and use half of them. You really want to get their attention. The other advantage is catfish love cut bait too. And where there's stripers, there's catfish. Um, <coughs> scented oils and gels. Uh, some guys use their scented oils on all of their baits, be it a lure, um, a live minnow, a cut bait, whatever it is. They still put that scented oil on it. I'm not sure if I put it on, I don't always put it on my live minnows because, well, it's freaking out. It's making its own smells. But uh, definitely for the cut baits, you know. Uh, I really like to put crawdad scent on my cut bait because strikers love crawdads. And uh, if you've got half of a fish floating around on the bottom and a striper's coming up and he smells that fish and crawdads, he's all over it. <laughs> and they'll, be, they'll take that pretty aggressively. And unlike a live bait, they just, they just inhale it. I mean, it's, it's pretty instant. So you can watch that hit and set your hook pretty quickly. You don't have to let them take it and play with it. Uh, some guys drift fish their, their cut bait. I, I personally don't like to drift fish my cut bait, but it works if you're... Um, I've done it down like on, on Brannan Island and whatnot. There's a couple of old levees that were breached. And so when the tide's going out, uh, it comes down the river and pours into this, uh, into this little flooded island. And there's a big drop off. It goes from 10 feet to 30 feet. And the fish always hang right there. So that's a good place to drift your cut bait. You know, and then you just you know, cast it up and drift with it through that cut, letting it bounce on the bottom, and you pick up quite a number of fish like that. Dead bait, again, this is just you know another uh, an extension of the cut bait, but definitely you know anchovies, <laughs> sardines, um, mussels, and clams. You know, you see those in the stores when you're in the bait store. And they'll have a bag of clams and mussels, and people think, oh, that's only for sturgeon. Oh, the the pile worm and the clams and the mussels, the striper's like that just as well. And if it's if it's in shell, you just it's dead, so you can open the shell real easy. Just thread a bunch of that onto your hook, a bunch of mussels on your hook, and add a fish or two. You know, a big old glob of bait is not a bad thing to a striper. They're not real picky. They're like mussels and dead fish. <laughs> so you know, you might get a sturgeon too, but you might get a striper. <laughs> Um, I, I like to, my dead bait, I like to, uh, again, uh, fish it on the bottom. I don't drift fish it very often. Usually we'll, we'll use like one to two ounces of weight to keep it in one place, fairly well anchored. Not like sturgeon fishing, we'll, we'll use like six ounces of weight so that it doesn't move anywhere. It's okay if it's bouncing along. Stripers are a lot more willing to follow your scent trail. Uh, lures. You know, I don't, I don't subscribe to the artificial only mantra as much as I used to. So on these guys, I used to fly fish all the time, and it was artificials only. And then I moved to California, and that's like, I really want to catch some fish. But I really love using artificials. So a lot of times we'll use flat-sided plugs like a rattle trap, um, and there's... You know, I don't know how many, 15 different brands of Rattlesack-esque lures out there. Um, but you just want, you know, big and white or big and silver with a little bit of gold on it. It's a great color combination. A black top and, a, you know, a bronze body is a great color combination. Uh, shallow diving plugs is really good. The, the Broken Back Rapala, everybody uses it out there at the port. You know, the, the classic colors in either gold and black or silver and black. And if you really want to amp it up, add a like a six inch white worm to the last hook and so that it's got you know this crazy crazy action 
and it's only swimming around about five feet under the water if you're if you're paddling at two miles an hour. And when we're trolling lures, that's usually what we try to hit. It's you know somewhere between 1.5 and two miles an hour for strikers. That's partly because that's what the speed it takes to get action on our lures. If you're using uh, you know a Rapala or I think I got some megabits in those boxes. Not megabits. Uh, trophy sticks. Those longer, longer diving lures. Um, they'll get down to 10 feet, but you have to be doing, you know, like one and a half, two miles an hour to get down to 10 feet. They really work well on stripers. They're big. They rattle. They make a lot of noise. They have a lot of flash. And they bring them in from a distance. Again, use some scent on them because smells make a difference, and everybody knows the Delta and California waters are generally fairly stained. Uh, in the clear waters, like on the American, the, a lot of times the plugs really underperform to bait, um, simply because the plugs are so flashy and the bait is so plentiful. So if you're, if you're trying to imitate an outbound smelt, and there's outbound smelt everywhere, and you're pulling along you know, this big, non-smelly outbound smelt imitation, they're just going to look at it and let it go by. Uh, Topwater poppers and stick baits. You know, in, if you want to catch topwater striped bass, the time to do it is like May, June, July. And you go out into the Delta, uh, again, out, you know, Sherman Island and all that out there, off of Highway 12. Uh, and right at sunrise, the fish will be crashing on shad. And then you can throw, you know, big six inch long poppers. Just pop it back across, you know, the whole canal line. Just plop, 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 plop. And you'll cast a lot, and every once in a while, the whole canal will explode and your lure will go away. Because uh, they really, I mean, they just hammer it when it's on the top. There's <laughs> But it's a lot of waiting. Uh, you know, it's, it's definitely a fish of a, you know, maybe not a thousand casts. It's not quite steelhead level. <laughs> but it's, you know, like 800. Uh -huh. um, if you're, no matter what, if you're fishing lures, you know, you want to use white and red or black and silver, black and gold, black and white. Uh, you know, I'll, they're eating these, these shad, the threadfin shad, the American shad, you know, the, the Sacramento hitch. They're, they're eating these, these fish that are either silver or gold on the sides. And so that's what you want to imitate. Uh, red really seems to trigger a good strike. A lot of times, if you're just trolling a five-inch plug, a red head, and a white body, you know they'll just nail that thing like it's nothing. Just bam. Um, so that's really good. You know, some days, you know, your plugs will catch just as many fish as your as your bait. No, <laughs> never mind. If Adam were here, he would shake his head because he always fishes bait and he always outfishes me when I'm pulling plugs. But um, yeah. Yes. Question. Okay, so this is a novice question probably, but what is how how long should you try with lure versus live bait? At what point do you want to switch? Like how long should you try with whatever it is that you're using before you try something else? If you're using live bait, don't switch. Okay. Just, <laughs> you know, if, if if you're using live bait, you're either gonna catch a fish or you're not. Ah, oh, okay. Right? Okay. If you're using lures, wait until you can't take it anymore, I guess, you know, it's like, it's, it's one of those things, it's like eventually you've been paddling for, you know, five, six, seven miles, you're like, this is really not cool at this point, mm -hmm. you know, I'm seeing birds, I'm seeing fish, <laughs> you know, my fish finder's marking all this great stuff and nothing's going on. Um, you know, after four or five hours, if you're still if you're still willing to stay out there, especially if you've bought live bait already, mm -hmm. and you've taken the care to keep it alive the whole time, yeah, you should switch over. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I always buy a two rod stamp, so a lot of times I'll use live bait on one rod, and then I'll fan cast and just really work an area with artificials. Okay. Then, if they're around, I'm guaranteed to have a fish. Mm -hmm. oh Guaranteed. <laughs> I'm more likely to have a fish by the end of the day. Okay. And I might get lucky and, and pull them in on the artificials. Okay. That's kind of what I'm after. Okay. Uh, some guys, you know, some guys will just pull swim baits all the time. They won't, pull, they won't do anything else but pull swim baits. Um, the big hammers are what 
you know, everybody on NCK just loves. Uh, the fish traps work just as well most of the time. Um, they don't have quite as much action, but it's pretty close. And you want uh, pearl, chartreuse, rainbow trout. Those are great colors. I think I had all three of those colors in one of those boxes. Uh, some of the old timers have a little saying. They say, if it ain't chartreuse, it ain't no use. Because <laughs> in the stained water, it stands out. And it looks like a fish. So, you know, that's, that's your objective, is to get their attention. Um, you want to use anywhere, if you're pulling swim baits, you want to use anywhere from like, like three-eighths of an ounce to an ounce and a half, depending on your current and speed. An ounce and a half is an awful lot, but if you're fishing in 40 feet of water and you want to get down to the bottom where the fish are hanging out, an ounce and a half might be what you need. Then um, again, if you're only fishing in 18 feet of water, three-quarter ounce might be just enough. You don't want to have to. You don't want to have one rod that's always, you know, back behind you, straining all day long. Because then, the more your rod's bending and you're not catching fish, the more you're working to get it to bend, which is just not fun. Um, so some final thoughts on this, though. But to find the stripers is kind of the hardest part. Getting them to bite is almost easier than finding them. Yeah. Yeah, Bill's laughing back there. <laughs> He's like, yeah. Uh, so to find them, you just got to watch that bottom structure and depth changes. If you don't have a fish finder and you're not ready to, you know, drill a hole in your kayak or get a portable fish finder, they've got some that just suction cup mount on. Um, and the bigger lakes, you can just guess bottom structure by the hillside above the water level. But a lot of times in the delta and on the canals, it's really, it's just not available. Um, so to figure out where to fish without a fish finder in the delta is a lot more hit and miss um, and a lot more lost lures because you'll think, okay, I figured it out. You know, sometimes if I, if I don't have my fish finder and I want to know the depth I'm at, I'll just take a, a swim bait and drop it to the bottom and then hand pull it up and count how far it is, you know, okay, this is 26 mm -hmm. feet. So you think, you know, okay, I'm going to set my rod for trolling at 20 feet, I'm at about 26 feet of water, and then all of a sudden you're snagged and it's gone. Because mm -hmm. you just can't see that the bottom's come up 8 feet or 10 feet. Mm -hmm. um, follow the birds, you know, you, a, a lot of the old striker guys, you know, and, and on some of these pictures I have on my, on my presentation, it's like, fishing the birds and caught this fish. Because the, the seagulls and the terns and everything, they'll, they look for those, that bait school. And so if they're flying around and they're just doing their business, they're always watching the water, mm -hmm. and they see a school of bait, they're gonna dive bomb the bait. And if the bait's all bunched up on top, it's doing that for a reason. So you wanna catch what's pushing it up. But, you know, again, follow <coughs> the birds. And then floating debris, this is, uh, floating debris works everywhere, and it can be a barge, or it can be a stick two feet long. <coughs> floating debris always attracts bait fish, and where there's bait fish, there's predatory fish. Um, so, you know, if you're out and about and you see a balloon on the water and it's floating along, hightail it to that balloon and fish under the balloon and and give it extra time. You know, don't just be like, oh yeah, no, and no, I'm going to go away and do my thing. You know, really give it some time because it's going to attract, you know, insects and little bait fish and whatnot, and eventually it will have brought in some larger fish. So, you know, those are those are really the keys: is just finding the fish and structure, debris, and and birds. You know, that's that's really the key. Um, a lot of times, if you're fishing. The edges of the canal, and you don't have a fish finder. You can you can see the uh, the hydrilla mat. You can see it under you, and then all of a sudden it'll disappear. And so that's that that weed mat will extend out, generally to like eight ten feet of water depth. And you can follow that line and troll as close as you can to it, without snagging up. And generally, it's the the edges of it is is pretty wavy. So, you know, if you, if you see the edge and you're trolling 50 feet behind you, 
a lot of times I'll keep I'll keep my right side like a foot off the edge of it and I'll troll off the left side of the boat mm -hmm. if I'm going you know down it on the right and so that puts my bait um, seven feet off the edge of it which can be too far the other option is try and keep it in my peripheral vision and troll the edge like this but then more often than not I end up hooking up with the weeds um, you know sometimes if, if, if it's a real tight um, defined boundary I'll actually move over so that I'm paddling right over the boundary with my line like 30-40 feet back and um, and that gets me you know three four feet off the edge and you'll pick up largemouth bass you'll pick up smallmouth bass you'll pick up stripers that way um, but you know without the fish finder that's one of your best ways to find find that structure uh, in the canals always watch for uh, pumping pipes you know you see them they come off the levee they go into the water uh, again, that's a piece of structure that's extending out quite a, way into, quite a ways into the water and it's going to attract minnows and bluegill and crawdads and everything else and it's going to attract stripers too. So fish that, fish that hard. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're casting plugs and lures and stuff, you know, you want to spend five minutes on it at least, if not twenty. You know, just really work it good. Uh, you know, sometimes if, if the pump's not running and it's nice and quiet, you just you know take a rope and throw it around the pipe, and anchor up to it real tight, and cast your line out, you know, 20 feet off of the, off of where the pipe's entering the water, with some cut bait or live bait, and you know you'll you will get something. It may not be a striper, but you will catch something because all the fish love that. Um, any pilings or docks or piers, uh, even large trees that overhang the water. If you're if you're on the McCallumy. Uh, and there's a big tree hanging over the water, and it's not in the water, it's just providing a bunch of shade. Fish under that, fish it hard, because that shade is providing structure for bait fish. So you want to you look for that. Uh, any downed logs, uh, any little sticks poking up, even a tiny stick poking up, like the size of my finger, you know, that indicates there's something bigger there. If I'm fishing, it doesn't matter what I'm fishing, I'm probably going to lose my first cast into it. You know, because you just can't see how big it is. Um, with the fish finder, you can kind of work around, work around the edges and find, okay, this is where this branch goes off. It's like a huge log or whatever. But you definitely want to fish that because it will hold fish. Mm -hmm. I can't think of anything else for catching strikers. Yeah, I don't know. Has anybody got any more questions? <laughs> yeah, of course. What's the minimum length that you can keep legally? 18 inches. 18, okay. And you get two. Oh, two. Okay. Only two. Okay. What size hooks are you using? Uh, for live bait? Yeah. Uh, a lot of times for live bait I'm using like a like a number two. Uh, for cut bait I'm using <clears throat> quite a bit bigger. I'm using like a one out or a two out. And I like to use a circle hook for that. Because I'll let them take it and swallow it. And then when I pull it back out it comes through and on the side. Mm -hmm. That's another reason I like to use that 20 pound uh, fluorocarbon um, because it's really tough and abrasion resistant and they've got some their little denticle plates are pretty fierce and you know light light mono is just gonna just come off you know you won't even have them hooked yet and they'll if you're pulling a circle hook through they'll, they'll rip through it. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm fishing for a bluegill it's like a number 10 <laughs> yeah, but I think most of the time, if I'm fishing, if I'm pulling minnows and stuff, um, yeah, uh, sometimes down to a number four, you know. And uh, any style seems to work pretty well. Uh, I, I avoid the long shank hooks because it just makes a bigger, a bigger piece of bait that I have to deal with. So a lot of times I'll use actually a wacky rig hook. Um, just a super wide gap, short hook to lip them. Yeah. In regards to the tournament this weekend, yeah, um, you want to talk a little bit about like catch, photo, release too, because obviously you know most tournaments you bring your fish in, but kayaks would do it a little different. We do it a little different, yeah. Um, so the tournament starts at uh, at 9 a.m. 
at the Port of Sacramento off of Jefferson Boulevard. There's uh, an access there called the Barge Canal Access. And there's parking for, I don't know, like 50 cars, maybe a little more. Yeah, for like 50 cars. Huh? At Broderick? No, at Barge. at Barge Canal. Oh, okay. Yeah. It says Broderick on my email, so. Mm. I'll have to check that. Doesn't matter to me. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely Barge Canal. We'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and post up the uh, the locations, and also Steve, uh, this gentleman Steve wrote a really nice post about the port. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to post up a link to that too on our Facebook page, um, and we'll, in a, you know, where to launch, when to meet, all that sort of stuff will be attached. Yeah. But it's pretty easy to find. You just uh, get off in West Sac on, on Jefferson Boulevard and uh, take it south for like three and a half miles and it's on the right hand side. Mm -hmm. You cross over a, a bridge and there's, there's a little walk right brown there. brown sign that marks the turnoff too that says Barge Canal Access. There is a brown sign, yeah. Yeah. But I'm, I'm usually driving too fast. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's a bad habit. Uh, I'm like, bridge, turn! <laughs> um, so start at 9, you have to be back by 3. Uh, catch photo release is... Uh, I don't think, did I? Did you see, did I, did I have an extra point for catch photo release on this one? Mm. I don't think I was giving out extra points on this one because it is a straight bass tournament and everything in the port is invasive. And we have a bunch of members that say, don't keep striped bass. <laughs> yeah. They were, they were put here for us to eat. Um, so, you, you know, you can see on this, that's called the hog trough. And it's a nice white board that you slide your fish up to the, nose it into the end and take a picture of it and you can let it go. Um, if you're going to bring in fish, because we're counting your top five fish, but only two of your fish can be striped bass. So it's not like you can catch photo release five stripers and win on five stripers. Um, but you know, if you want to release your black bass or your largemouth or anything else like that, that's just to that's totally fine. Uh, you have to follow DFG rules, so no bringing your own bait. Well, no bringing your own bluegills. You can buy bait at Penny Bait, uh, which is just like four miles from there on Jefferson Boulevard or downtown at Broadway Bait. Uh, you can probably buy bait here in Lodi, can't you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Martini's, I'm not sure what time they open, but yeah. Yeah. they're usually open at five. Mm -hmm. People should be open for a nine o'clock tournament. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Just talk to Christian now. Now, the, the reason it's, it's from nine to three is because high tide is at noon. Mm -hmm. So we're going to fish all the incoming and part of the slack and a little bit of the off. Uh, there's a, uh, a, a ramp down to the water. You'll want to bring some wheels because it's, I don't know, 150 foot and you have to go down about 35 feet. Um, the port is a big place. If you paddle to your left from the launch, uh, about half a mile down are a bunch of, of big giant docks with signs on them that say don't come within 100 feet of docks or boats. Please respect that. Uh, we have, we've been, not we, some of the members of NCK have slowly been making enemies with the security guards that patrol there because two years ago they decided they were going to start enforcing this before they put up signs. So they were hassling everybody in kayaks for a long time <coughs> and then put up signs. And everybody was like, you know what, screw you. Mm -hmm. But please, you know, 100 feet, and you know, you're in a kayak, you're on the water. How easy is it to tell what 100 feet is, right? Mm -hmm. So basically, if you're not next to the ship, you're cool. <laughs> uh, if you're not under the docks, you're cool. Um, if you go to the right, you go up to a couple of locks and the locks are some really great places to fish. You can actually tie off on the edge of the lock, just watch the tide because the tide's going to be coming up. So you don't want to tie off and then roll in. Um, sometimes I sneak into the lock through the big giant boards and then have to time my exit just right because again, you know, the boards are like 12 by 12. 
so you don't want to be stuck in there for three hours. Um, then again, there's salmon and stripers in there because it really congregates the bait fish. So the fishing inside the, the lock mechanism is usually really good. Uh, let's see what else. We're uh, checking at 3 o'clock, depending on how cold it is, we'll rush down the street to a uh, uh, pizza joint. Uh, not Mountain Mike's. Um, it's a round table. Round table, yeah. Yeah, it's just right like a mile from there. And they've got a big banquet room we're going to hang out in. Um, your $10 entry fee into the tournament doesn't get you pizza, so you got to <laughs> buy your own food. Um, but given that you know it's like dark at five o'clock basically on that day, I didn't want to have a potluck <laughs> with you know anticipated temperatures of 34 degrees at, at you know 5:15. Just wasn't feeling it. Um, um, what I do have a question. What's the uh, condition of the water going to be after all this wonderful rain we've had? Dark. Good for surgeon. Good for surgeon. Yeah. Yeah, roughly the same color as a cesspool. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. It's gonna be all turned up because it's gonna be yeah. dark on there. Okay. Yeah. Um, it will be messy. It'll be dirty. We have a trash prize that we're giving away. <laughs> I always do two trash prizes. <laughs> the Port of Sacramento is an urban fishing location, and I really, really like to encourage trash pickup. So uh, the trash prize for this one is better than it was for the last one. The last event was free. I didn't have any money to use. This event, I had some money. So we're giving away a couple of really nice fillet knives and some other goodies. Um, for this event, first place is a Powell fishing rod, which is a really, really beautiful rod. I really want it myself, but I can't win it. Um, second place is another fishing rod, a, uh, a Tiger Light made by Ugly Stick, a really nice rod. And third place is also a fishing rod, but it's really special. So if you log on to NCK and, and type in the model number for that rod, then you'll know exactly what you're getting. It's awesome. <laughs> um, I bought one for myself when I was at Bass Pro, and I was like, this rod is so cool. I was just playing with it all the way through Bass Pro, just really enjoying myself. And I was like, you know what? This needs to be third place. So got a third place rod for that. Um, for the series this year, if you've been to, the, you know, you've, you've come to three events now, um, I don't have the tallies uh, calculated up yet. I know it doesn't sound like a big deal, but my gosh, a baby is just crazy busy. Uh, but the series winner gets a GoPro, thanks to Headwaters. Uh, the silver edition, which is really, really schnaz. And second place wins a fish finder. And third place has a really nice net. Uh, and we'll give all that stuff away at Roundtable Pizza. Mm -hmm. Very cool. And hopefully, according to my um, pocket computer, it's going to be nice weather, sunny, 56 degrees, mm -hmm. not even cold at night. It's only supposed to be like 47 that night, which is really good. So hopefully the water will be fairly warm. If the water is at about 56 degrees, 57 degrees, we should have a great day of fishing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Bring your bait. <laughs> Bring your bait. Bait, bait, bait. Yeah, that's the striker mantra. Okay. Other questions? Sweet. Well, thanks for coming. Yeah. Well, thanks, Jim. Appreciate you doing And like I said before, I'm going to go ahead and uh, post up the link as far as uh, where we're going to be launching and as well as just um, some of the basics of how to fish the port. I'll, uh, I'll link that both up on our Facebook page and uh, any, anybody here read our blog? Some of you guys? Okay, I'll post it up on the blog as well. And then um, we're going to hope to have a little video um, to send so you guys can uh, actually log on to YouTube and watch a video and uh, be reminded of some of the things we covered tonight. So really appreciate you guys coming out and uh, we got a raffle. We got. Uh,